Good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 11th of January 2022. Displayed here are the list of news articles chosen for today's discussion. See today I have discussed two topics exclusively in prelims perspective and two more topics in mains perspective and as I assured you I have discussed an economic topic also. Now without wasting much time let's move on to our discussion. Look at this image which shows a tusker taking bath with the aid of its owners in ahead of the temple festival season in Kerala. See now let us take this opportunity to know about the elephant species in detail. So today I'll focus mainly on the prelims perspective on this topic. Okay. Now let us start our discussion. See the elephant belonging to the elephantidae family is the largest living land animal characterized by its long trunk, columnar legs and huge head with the temporal glands and wide flat ears. See this long trunk is nothing but elongated upper lip and nose and the nostrils are located at the tip of this trunk. See the trunk is large and powerful weighing about 130 kg that is 290 pounds in an adult male and it is capable of lifting a load of about 250 kg. The trunk is innervated by two proboscidean nerves which render it extremely sensitive. See at the end of the trunk are flap like projections enabling the elephant to perform amazingly delicate functions such as picking up a coin from a flat surface. See the elephants are grayish to brown in color and their body hair is sparse and coarse. Okay. See the breathing, drinking and eating are all vital functions of the trunk. Most breathing is performed through the trunk rather than the mouth. The elephants drink by sucking as much as 10 liters that is 2.6 gallons of water into the trunk and then squirting it into the mouth. See they also eat by detaching grasses, leaves and fruits with the end of the trunk and using it to place this vegetation into the mouth. The trunk is also used to collect dust or grass for spraying onto themselves. Why do they do so? See, they do so for protection against insect bites and the sun. And if danger is suspected, the elephants raise and swirl the trunk as if it were an olfactory periscope. Possibly sniffing the air for information. Okay. So now let us see few more body parts of an elephant and few important behavior of it in prelims perspective. Now we will see about the tusk. See the elephant tusks are enlarged incisor teeth made of ivory. In the African elephant both the male and the female possesses tusk whereas in the Asian elephant it is mainly the male that has tusk. See when present in the female tusks are very small thin and often of a uniform thickness. Some male Asian elephants are even tuskless and are known as muknas. See the tusk size and shape are inherited. Okay. See the tusks are used for defense, offense, digging, lifting objects, gathering food and stripping bark to eat from trees. Also they protect the sensitive trunk which is tucked between them when the elephant charges. Okay, in times of drought, elephants dig water holes in dry river beds by using their tusks, feet and trunks. See how intelligent is it, right? Now we will see about the reproduction and life cycle of this elephant species. See, elephants live in small family groups led by old females. Where food is plentiful, the groups join together. Most females live in bachelor herds. Male elephants become uncontrollable even by their own handlers during the must period which is the time for establishing their reproductive hierarchy. See elephants are able to assess the reproductive status of one another by using their keen sense of smell. See the gestation period of the elephants is the longest of any mammal which is about 18 to 22 months. Now let's see about the newborn. Okay, the newborn elephant is about a meter that is 3.3 feet tall and weighs about 100 kg. So it is about 220 pounds. See the newborn suckles by using the mouth and not the trunk at the mammary glands. 
and this female remains with their natal herd for their whole lives despite living apart the adult male and female elephants form short lived mating or feeding associations with one another see elephants can live to 80 years of age or more in captivity but they live only for 60 years in the wild Elephants produce two types of vocalization by modifying the size of the nostrils as air is passed through the trunk. For example, the low sounds like the growl and high sounds like trumpet, pulsated trumpet, gruff, cry, etc., are produced by this kind of modification. See, they use low frequency, that is, five to twenty-four hertz sounds for calls that are responded by other elephants up to four kilometers away. Now let's see about their migration. See elephants migrate seasonally according to the availability of food and water. Here you have to note that the memory plays an important role during this time as they remember the locations of water supplies along with the migration routes. See as I said before these are intelligent species, okay? Intelligence has also been observed in conjunction with their memory they can reach a top speed of about 40 kilometers that is 25 miles per hour since their feet are well adapted to carrying their great time interesting right and see these elephants are found most often in savannas grasslands and forests but occupy a wide range of habitats including deserts swamps and highlands in tropical and subtropical regions of africa and asia So far we saw in general about the elephant species now we'll discuss about the two african elephant species namely african forest elephant whose scientific name is loxodenta cyclotis and the african savanna elephant whose scientific name is loxodenta africana along with an asian elephant species whose scientific name is elephas maximus know that the african forest elephant which lives in rainforest was recognized as a separate species in the year 2000 now we'll see one by one in detail and then we'll discuss few major differences between the asian elephant species and the two african elephant species okay first let us start with forest elephants forest elephants are smaller darker and their tusks are straighter and point downward See they have more oval shaped ears. They are the elusive cousin of the African savanna elephant and they inhabit the dense rainforest of the western central Africa and are uniquely adapted to the dense forest habitat of the Congo basin. See their preference for dense forest habitat prohibits traditional counting methods such as visual identification. then how will their population be estimated they are estimated through dung counts and analysis on the ground of the density and distribution of the feces see the forest elephants also have a much slower reproductive rate than the savanna elephants so they cannot bounce back from population declines as quickly at the same rate That's the reason this African forest elephant is given a critically endangered status under the IUCN. Their last strongholds are located in Gabon, Republic of Congo, with smaller population remaining in other African countries like Cameroon, Central African Republic, Equatorial Guinea and Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana in West Africa. See they live in family groups of up to 20 individuals and forage on leaves grasses seeds fruit and tree bark they are referred to as the mega gardener of the forest why so see their diet is dominated by fruit and hence they play a crucial role in dispersing many tree species particularly the seeds of large trees which tend to have high carbon content Also they gather at mineral rich water holes and mineral lakes found throughout the forest to supplement their diet with minerals okay next we'll see about the savanna elephants savanna elephants are larger than the forest elephants and their tusks curve outwards there are also differences in the size and shape of the skull and skeleton 
you can see in these images to understand their structural difference see this african savanna elephants are the largest species of elephant and the biggest terrestrial animal on earth they are easily distinguished by their very large ears which allow them to radiate excess heat see their front legs are noticeably longer than the hind legs their largest population are in southern and eastern african countries including botswana zimbabwe tanzania kenya namibia zambia and south africa see they are well studied and populations are easily estimated because of their visibility within the open areas where they live each family unit usually consists of around 10 females and their calves and the male associate with these herds only during the mating see several family units often join together to form a clan consisting of up to several hundred members led by a female yes it is a matriarchal community see due to their habitat savanna elephants are often found grazing on grasses but they also browse on a wide variety of plants and fruits the selection varies depending on the time of the year that is during rainy season the elephant will feed more on grass than during the dry season so in general you can say that the african elephants weighs about 8000 kg that is 9 tons and its height is 3 to 4 meters that is 10 to 13 feet at the shoulder level and the african elephants have much larger ears which are used to, to dissipate body heat now let us see about the asian elephant see the asian elephant includes three subspecies the indian or mainland the sumatran and the sri lankan see the asian elephant inhabit dry to wet forest and grassland habitats in 13 range countries spanning south and southeast asia while they have preferred forage plants they also have area based resources adaptation to survive they are extremely sociable forming groups of 6 to 7 related females that are led by the oldest female yes they are also matriarchal community like african elephants these groups occasionally join others to form larger herds although these associations are relatively short lived in asia elephant herd sizes are significantly smaller than those of the savanna elephants in africa see their weight is about 5500 kg and has a shoulder height of up to 3.5 meters note that their favorite foods are cultivated crops such as bananas rice and sugar cane they are always close to a source of fresh water because they need to drink at least once a day in asia humans have had close associations with elephants over many centuries and elephants have become important cultural icons remember elephant is a national heritage animal of india now let us see few more important differences between the african elephant and the asian elephants See the African elephants have two trunk extremities one above and one below whereas the Asian elephant have only one and the Asian elephant most often curls the tip of its trunk around an item and picks it up in a method called grasp whereas the African elephant uses the pinch means picking up of objects in a manner similar to that of the humans See the trunk of the African elephant may be more extendable but that of the Asian elephant is probably more dexterous and the last difference see the African elephants become sexually mature sooner than the Asian elephants that's all about this news article so we have mainly discussed about the elephant species in general and in particular we discussed about the African elephant species and the Asian elephant now let's move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article this news article provides insights on the recent visit of chinese foreign minister to sri lanka during this visit many initiatives to strengthen sri lanka china bilateral relationship were discussed so in this discussion let us see these initiatives briefly and its implication on india see the syllabus relevant to this news article is given here for your reference please go through it 
Now let's start our discussion. The Chinese Foreign Minister visited Sri Lanka as a part of his financial tour in the new year. See additionally, the visit also marks two important anniversaries in the Sino-Lanka relationship. See, China and Sri Lanka established their diplomatic relations in the year 1957. So this year marks the 65th anniversary of this diplomatic relations right but even before this an agreement strengthened sino lanka relations it was the rubber rice pact between china and lanka so it was signed in the year 1952 and this was a post independence period for lanka and it was facing its worst food crisis including rice shortage This was due to the global rice shortage. So, this led to the rise in world price of rice by 38%. Additionally, Lanka was a key exporter of rubber, but the world price of rubber slumped. At this time, China came to its aid and China needed to import rubber. So this rubber rice pact was signed and under this pact China provided rice to Lanka at lower prices than international prices and in turn China also imported rubber from Lanka at higher prices than in the global market so this pact provided a market for Lanka surplus rubber and it also accessed food grains at lower prices In this manner China Lanka relations got strengthened even before they formally established their diplomatic relation and note that in the year 2022 this pact is going to celebrate its 70th anniversary see this pact gains significance in the current scenario because Sri Lanka is battling a severe economic crisis now and through the discussion it is expected that China will again extend its helping hands to Sri Lanka See this economic crisis existed during pre-pandemic period and is further aggravated by the pandemic. It is mainly the result of many irresponsible moves of Sri Lankan government in the past. Let us see what were these briefly. First is the high government spending and tax cuts. This eroded state revenues. Second, its foreign exchange reserves reduced. It came to its lowest levels in a decade. Third is the debt repayment owed by Sri Lanka to other countries, especially to China. Sri Lanka owes more than five billion dollars to China. Apart from all this, the pandemic affected Lanka's tourism sector. See this aggravated the economic woes because more than 10% of Lanka's GDP is contributed by its tourism sector. This in turn has also affected its exchange rate because tourism is one of the Lanka's main foreign currency earners. This led to dollar crunch to the level that in 2021 Sri Lanka rupee fell by 7.5% against the US dollar. this again led to inflation that is rising prices of many essential items over the last year why because lanka is a net importer of food and other commodities okay so overall currently lanka faces persisting dollar crunch increasing living cost and shortage of essentials therefore during this visit by chinese foreign minister Many measures were discussed to ease the economic stress and enhance the bilateral relations. Let's see them one by one. First, Sri Lankan president urged China to restructure Sri Lanka's debt. Second, Chinese side stressed on Colombo Port City project and Hambantota port projects. See, for modernizing the Hambantota port, Sri Lanka took loan from China, but it couldn't repay it. So, in the year 2017. an agreement was signed for debt equity swap under which the loan was converted into equity so as of now chinese side holds the majority of the shares of this port therefore the hambantota port was declared as a part of its belt and road initiative by china see this move is what is called as debt trap diplomacy of china's belt and road initiative Apart from investing in Hambantota port, China has also invested in Colombo International Financial City, see which is also called the Colombo Port City project. The investment for this project was announced in the year 2014, but it raised many concerns. 
First, it raised environmental concerns as the project involved reclamation of and from the sea. Second, India raised concerns over maritime sovereignty because during the start of the project, Chinese submarines and a warship was docked in Colombo port. Apart from this, there were also accusations of lack of transparency and corruption in the project. So the project was suspended in the year 2015. But again it was restarted under a new government in 2016 but here the sri lankan government assured that investors from all the countries would be invited to invest in the port city more importantly it assured that it will not allow chinese warships to use its harbors but india is concerned over these projects mainly india's fear is about china's intentions in its neighborhood you know that already china is increasing its naval presence in the indian ocean and the access to these two ports will further increase china's naval presence in the indian ocean see india is also worried that china would eventually take control of the sri lanka's infrastructure So overall like other neighbors of India China is also roping in Sri Lanka under its sphere of influence this is a definite threat to India's economic security and maritime security for instance it might affect the India and Sri Lanka's largest joint military exercises called Mitra Shakti and a naval exercise called Slenex S L I N E X okay So these points can be utilized in your main answers especially when questions comes under the topic security threats due to neighborhood countries that's all about this news article now let us move on to the next article discussion see this editorial article here is written by the india's former ambassador to russia and india had invited central asian leaders to be the chief guest of the republic day parade so in this context the author had discussed about the importance of the central asian countries in india's security interest and foreign diplomacy he also talks about the shift of focus on eurasia by global geopolitical powers and india's continental and maritime security issues has also been covered by the article so this is the crux of the article we'll discuss each and every part of the article in detail more importantly you can use these points in your main answers so pay close attention before starting our discussion the syllabus relevant to the topic is given here for your reference please refer it now let's start our discussion see we have heard the word strategy a lot of times in this discussion also we are going to see the continental and maritime security strategy of india so what does the word strategy mean strategy is a plan of action designed to achieve a long term or overall aim the strategy mentioned in this article is meaning the highest level of national state craft that establishes how states or other political units prioritize and mobilize military diplomatic political and economic also other sources of power to ensure what they perceive as national interest thus A careful plan determines how goals can be achieved with the resources we have. I'll give you an example here for a better understanding. Now take the focus on Russia. To achieve connectivity and economic interest is the goal. And how India will achieve this and the plan it formulates to make this goal come true is the strategy. I hope you understood the meaning of the word strategy. Now we'll see what is continental strategy and maritime strategy. See, if the plan is formulated to achieve interest regarding border issues, then it is called continental strategy, and if it is to secure the maritime interest, then it is called as maritime strategy. Now we'll see the continental issues for India. India's partition and the emergence of a persistent two-front threat from Pakistan and China has set the stage for a tough continental dimension of our security. There is an increased militarization of the borders with Pakistan and China. See, connectivity means nothing when access is denied by hostile activities of the persistent neighboring states, which is contrary to the provisions of the international law. The difficulty here is in operationalizing an alternative route. See, the international north-south transport corridor is not bearing fruits on account of the U.S. hostile attitude towards Iran. 
we have kaladan multimodal project and trilateral highways which provides connectivity to the east but that is also not without any issues who all set the stage for a complex geopolitical competition on the eurasian landmass there are many like china's assertive rise the withdrawal of forces of the us and the nato from afghanistan the rise of islamic fundamentalist forces that is the taliban then the changing dynamics of the historic stabilizing role of russia and related multilateral mechanisms like the shanghai cooperation organization the collective security treaty organization and the eurasian economic union see all these have set the stage for a complex geopolitical competition on the eurasian landmass we'll see the assertive rise of china and what it means see the chinese capacity for military intervention and power projection are growing far beyond its intermediate region it is expanding on the eurasian continent like its belt and road initiative projects in central asia up to central and eastern europe and the caucasus is an example it undermines the traditional russian influence it is gaining access to energy and other natural resources and another major strategy is its dependency creating investment otherwise called as debt trap diplomacy see regarding this debt trap diplomacy i had already discussed in the previous article with china lanka relations right thus debt trap diplomacy makes the regional countries dependent on china for the funding of all development projects cyber and digital penetrations and expanding influence among political and economic elites also is prevalent across the continent note that the american military footprint has shrunk dramatically on the eurasian landmass though it has a substantial military presence on the continental peripheries so with these developments india's physical connectivity challenges with the eurasia have only become more difficult the marginalization of india on the eurasian continent in terms of connectivity must be reversed otherwise with two hostile neighbors there is pakistan and china it will be difficult for india to further its connectivity to the world like how the association of southeast asian nations that is asean centrality is a key to indo pacific the centrality of the central asian states is a key for eurasia now let us see the maritime issues for india but before that let's see about india's coast india has a 7516.6 km long coastline which includes 5422 km of coastline in the mainland and 2094 km of coastline bordering the islands the peninsula coastline of the country is shaped by the bay of bengal in the east Indian Ocean in the south and the Arabian Sea in the west and is spread over nine states and four union territories namely Gujarat, Daman and Dew, Maharashtra, Goa, Karnataka, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Pondicherry, Andhra Pradesh, Odisha and West Bengal. In addition there are two island groups who are they Lakshadweep and Minicoy in Arabian Sea and Andaman and Nicobar in the Bay of Bengal. See India has a rich maritime tradition however the colonial period and the ensuing years of post independence when the country faced significant security threats along its land borders to the north and the west these land security issues have severely undermined India's capacity for maritime thought See the 2008 Mumbai terror attack was the largest catalyst in transforming perceptions of the maritime security in India before these attacks there was little government engagement with maritime security issues okay see india's maritime security issues are multifold take the creek areas of gujarat and the sundarbans in west bengal that are in particular vulnerable to criminal and anti national activities then take the northern gujarat and southern west bengal that is the sundarban areas which have several large creeks some of which are the international borders with pakistan and bangladesh see these creeks are all interconnected by smaller water bodies the interconnectivity of the creeks 
has made the border porous for infiltrators smugglers and terrorists who have been using these routes to sneak in and out of india okay now let's see the other issues the other issues include armed robbery in some ports in gujarat and andhra pradesh illegal fishing in odisha tamil nadu andaman nicobar islands karnataka andhra pradesh maharashtra and gujarat next will be poaching of sea cucumbers from lakshadweep and minikoy islands and tamil nadu then drug trafficking of the gujarat tamil nadu and maharashtra then you can take smuggling of gold in tamil nadu red sandal wood in gujarat and maharashtra cigarettes in maharashtra also the smuggling of fuel in andhra pradesh and maharashtra then smuggling of tendu leaves in tamil nadu and smuggling of textiles in west bengal even you can take the smuggling of turmeric in tamil nadu all these issues are of concern for india adding to the already discussed issues the physical proximity of india's coast to politically volatile economically depressed and unfriendly countries such as sri lanka bangladesh pakistan and gulf countries adds to its vulnerability now we shall see how firstly the geographical closeness of the southern coast to a conflict ridden sri lanka also poses security challenges for india for example the presence of ldte militants seriously undermined india's internal security as they started indulging in the smuggling of essential items diesel arms explosive drugs etc to sustain their war in sri lanka see they also created an extensive criminal network to smuggle sri lankan refugees from india to develop countries to generate funds for their struggle now you can link the previous news article discussion here that is why sri lanka's relationship with china is a cause of concern for india Okay now coming back to this article secondly let us see the case of bangladesh see the eastern indian seaboard has been increasingly witnessing a steady increase in illegal migration from bangladesh various push and pull factors such as poverty demographic pressure religious persecution in bangladesh and the promise of better opportunities in india have contributed to this migration and finally the unsettled maritime boundaries not only pose serious security challenges but also hinder offshore development india's maritime boundaries with pakistan are not delineated because of overlapping claims right see having seen about the issues now let us see what india has done so far see india's maritime vision and ambitions have grown dramatically during the past decade it is symbolized by national maritime strategy the security and growth for all in the region that is sagar initiative for the indian ocean region and it is also visible through other initiatives relating to the indo pacific and the quad in which maritime security's concentration is prominent see it is a response for the dramatic rise of china as a military power in the south china sea and the indian ocean region see the maritime security is crucial when considering china because it is important to keep sea lanes open for trade commerce and to ensure freedom of navigation by resisting chinese territorial aggrandizement in the south china sea and helping littoral states resist chinese bullying in the interstate relations okay however maritime security and associated dimensions of naval power are not sufficient instruments of state craft this is not sufficient because india seeks diplomatic and security constructs to strengthen deterrence against chinese unilateral actions and the emergence of a unipolar asia that is china centric asia so from this it is very clear that india will not have the luxury of choosing one over the other that is choosing between continental strategy and maritime strategy 
India needs to acquire strategic vision and deploy the necessary resources to pursue the continental interests without ignoring the interests in the maritime domain. That's all about this news article. See, you can very well utilize the points of the previous news article and this news article for your mains answer writing, especially under India's security and its neighborhood relations. Okay, now let's move on to our next article discussion. Look at this news article. This article talks about the growth potential of the Indian IT industry. See, the article says that with various industries all over the world increasingly adopting cloud computing and quickly modernizing their technology, the Indian IT sector will be in demand all over the world. So, it is expected that in 2022, the IT industry will witness a growth rate of 20% to 30%. This is the crux of the news article here. So in this context, let us discuss the various sectors in the Indian economy, their contributions to GDP and finally we will discuss the importance of the IT sector for the Indian economy. The syllabus regarding this discussion is highlighted here. Just go through it. Now let us start our discussion. See the various sectors in the Indian economy can be divided based on three broad categories. They are on the basis of the nature of the activity. Second, on the basis of the work condition. Thirdly, on the basis of asset ownership. First, let us take classification based on the nature of work conditions. See here, the sectors can be classified into organized and unorganized. What are these organized sectors? See, organized sectors in the Indian context are sectors that are registered with the government. So, the people working in the organized sectors have fixed employment terms and social security coverage. Then take the case of unorganized sector. See, the government regulations are lax with respect to the unorganized sectors, which means they are not sufficiently strict. See, the workers have no security of employment and social security coverage in the unorganized sectors. Now coming to the next classification, here the classification is based on the nature of ownership. See here the sectors are classified as the public sector and private sector. Take the case of public sector, the government has the majority ownership in terms of public sector. Okay. See the government has the majority ownership when you take the public sector. But in the case of private sector, the private individual has the majority ownership. Finally, let us take the classification based on the nature of activity. Here, the sector can be divided into three types. What are they? Primary sector, secondary sector and tertiary sector. Now, let's see in detail one by one. See, the primary sector produces the base for all other sectors. So, it involves activities where natural resources are directly used. The example you can see is agriculture, mining, dairy and fishing industry. Now take the secondary sector. They mainly include processing of the materials produced by the primary sector. See here cultivation of cotton comes under the primary sector and conversion of cotton fiber in the textile mills comes under the secondary sector. So the secondary sector mainly includes the industry sector. Okay. Now we will see about the tertiary sector. See it mainly includes the service sector. Means it includes the IT sector, banking and finance. Even transportation services, retail, hospitality, etc. are also under this sector. Okay. Now look at this data from the 2020 to 2021 economic survey. See the graph shows the contribution of important sectors like agriculture, industry and services to India's gross value addition that is GVA. In the case of India, the maximum contribution that is to the tune of 54% of GVA is by the service sector and agriculture contributing only 20% of GVA. If you look at the graph carefully, you can see that from the 2019 to 2020 to 2020 to 2021, the contribution of agriculture increased by 2%. This is due to the COVID induced lockdown which did not affect the agriculture sector as much as it affected the other sectors. Okay. Now having done with this various sectors in the Indian economy, let us now move on to the importance of the IT sector to the Indian economy. 
See, India is the leading outsourcing destination across the world. India accounted for approximately 55% of the global market share of the US dollar 200 to 250 billion in the year 2019 to 2020. In terms of FDI inflow, the computer software and hardware sector attracted the second highest FDI. Between April 2000 and March 2021, it attracted over say US dollar 71 billion. So domestically the IT industry accounted for 8% of India's GDP in the year 2020 so according to the software technology park of india that is stpi the software exports by the it companies stood at rupees 1.2 lakh crores if you say it in us dollars it is 16.29 billion us dollars in the first quarter of the financial year 2022 See, in case of employment, if you consider the IT industry, it is the largest contributor to the private organized employment. See, the Indian IT industry employs close to four million directly. Further, every job in the technology sector had a multiplier effect, leading to the creation of two point five indirect jobs in the adjacent sectors. Right. So it is projected that by 2025 India will have 900 million active internet users. See this coupled with the growing demand for cloud computing and every business rapidly taking steps to have a digital footprint the Indian IT sector will continue to propel India's growth story. So now the government in its part has recognized the importance of this IT sector. How It has announced various initiatives for boosting the sector. See, take the national policy on information and technology that was announced in the year 2012. See, this NPITs or you can say national policy on information and technology has a vision to develop India into an IT hub and use IT cyberspace as a source for inclusive and rapid growth in the national economy. It also aims to make India into a knowledge economy. Also in 2020 the government published the draft data center policy. This policy was published by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. What is the aim of this policy? It aims to make India the global data center hub. The main component of the policy is the government providing infrastructure status to the data center sector. This will help the sector avail cheap credit and help in the development of the sector. Okay. See this policy will help the growth of the digital economy in India. Now that's all about this news article. See, as I assured you of an economic topic in my every video through which I try to brush up some basics of economy. In this discussion, we discuss about the various sectors of the Indian economy, then contributions of agriculture, industry and services to the Indian economy. And finally with respect to the news article we discuss the importance of the IT sector to the Indian economy and some measures and policies taken by the Indian government in regards to the IT sector with this let us conclude the discussion and take up the next news article see this image here shows the kathakali performance in progress in palakkad it is a part of the national women kathakali mahotsavam which coincides with the anniversary of the Kathakali Gramam Kalukulangara so in this context we are going to learn about Kathakali for prelims perspective and a brief about the festival also see this Kalukulangara Kathakali Gramam is a non profit organization it was established in the year 2012 that works primarily in the domain of art and culture its primary office is in Palakkad Kerala So for the anniversary of this organization Kathakali performances are organized. So this is the background. Now let us see about the dance which is only useful for us for the prelims. See in the temples of Kerala two forms of dance drama Ramanatam and Krishnatam evolved under the patronage of feudal lords. These dramas narrate episodes from Ramayana and Mahabharata. See these folk drama traditions later became the source of Kathakali which derived its name from the word katha meaning story and kali meaning drama it is closely related to kudiyattam which is a sanskrit drama tradition and other ancient martial arts performance also 
See, it is a wonderful combination of music, dance, and drama. However, with the breakdown of the feudal setup, Kathakali began declining as an art form. It was revived in the 1930s by the famous Malayali poet V. N. Menon under the patronage of Mukunda Raja. See now, let's see some of the features of the Kathakali dance. Kathakali is generally an all-male true performance. There is minimal use of props in the Kathakali recital. However, very elaborate facial makeup along with the headgear is used for different characters. The main feature of the costume is a large billowing shirt for male characters. Different colors have their own significance. Like green indicates nobility, divinity and virtue. Whereas red patches beside the nose indicate royalty and the black color is used to indicate evil and wickedness. Whereas the yellow color is for saints and women and the completely red painted face indicates evil while the white beard indicates beings with higher consciousness and divinity. See, it involves both dance and drama and the two cannot be clearly separated. Most of the Kathakali recitals are a grand representation of the eternal conflict between good and evil. It draws its themes from the stories narrated in the epics and the Puranas. It is also called as the Ballad of the East. Generally, the language used for Kathakali songs is Manipravalam, that is a mixture of Malayalam and Sanskrit. See, music is important to rightfully convey the entire drama to the viewers. Next, the important part is gestures. They are perhaps the crown jewel of the entire dance drama. Right? See, the Kathakali is remarkable in the representation of the rasas through movements of eye and eyebrows through which the story is conveyed. See, nine important facial expressions called Navarasas are taught to convey the different emotions. Extensive hand gestures are also used. Therefore, this dance form calls for strenuous training. See, Kathakali is generally performed in open air theatres covered with coarse mats or temple premises with lush green trees of Kerala providing a backdrop. See, a brass lamp is used for lighting. The arrival of dawn accompanied with the continuous sound of drums, chenda and madala marks the beginning and end of a Kathakali recite. Kathakali symbolizes the element of sky or ether. The famous proponents include Guru Kunchukurup, Gopinath, Kotakal Sivaraman, Rita Ganguly, etc. And that's all about this news article. With this, we have come to the end of our news article discussion. Now, let us discuss the answers for our prelims practice questions. Take the first question. It is with reference to the elephant species. And see, it is a statement type question. So, you can go in for elimination technique here. Okay. Read the first statement. It has good memory power. Yes, it is correct. The elephant species has good memory power and good intelligence and due to its temporal gland. Okay. Second statement. Asian elephants weigh more than its cousin African elephants. No, the statement is absolutely wrong because the African elephant weighs more than the Asian elephant. I'll just recall you the weights that we saw in our discussion. See, African elephant weighs about 8,000 kg and this Asian elephant weighs about 5,500 kg. So, the statement is incorrect. Now, look at the third statement. Both male and female African elephants possess tusks. Yes, it is correct. Both the male and female will have tusks in African elephant species. Okay. Now, coming to the options. See, when you found that statement 2 is incorrect, you can just go in for eliminating the options. So, you can eliminate option C and D and you will have option A and B. Now, you know that statements 1 and 3 is correct. So, your answer here is option B, 1 and 3 only. Now, let's take the next question. It is about the Cyber Surakshit Bharat Initiative. See, it is a two statement question. Here, both statements are correct. 
how see first statement says it focuses on recognizing the need to strengthen the cyber security ecosystem in india yes and it is in alignment with the honorable prime minister's vision for a digital india so that is correct and looking into the second statement it is launched by ministry of electronics and information technology yes it was launched by them along with the national e governance division and industry partners so your answer will be option c both 1 and 2 now i'll give a brief about the cyber surakshit bharat see it will be operated on the three principles which are awareness education and enablement so it will include an awareness program on the importance of cyber security a series of workshops on best practices and enablement of the officials with cyber security health toolkits to manage and mitigate cyber threats and the cyber surakshit bharat is the first public private partnership of its kind and it will leverage the expertise of the it industry in cyber security see the founding partners of the consortium are leading it companies now let's take the last question see it is with reference to the kathakali that we discussed lastly see two statements are given so you have to go through both the statements statement 1 is incorrect because generally it's an all male form of dance but the statement here says no female is depicted is not true because yellow painted face depicts female character in the dance so statement 1 is incorrect so look at this second statement in that the second part which says black is used to indicate evil and wickedness is correct but the first part is wrong this is because the color yellow indicates saints and women and the color green only indicates nobility divinity divinity and virtue so the answer here is option d neither one not two because both statements are incorrect displayed here are the mains questions please go through it and write your answers and post it in the comment box whenever we get time we'll evaluate it and reply back to you through the comment box itself if you like this video do like share and comment and don't forget to subscribe to our shankar ias academy youtube channel thank you for listening